All departments reporting full mission readiness. We've got our full complement on board. This is my favorite moment, right now. The start of a new mission is always full of possibility. The Orion Syndicate could sell it as a drug. <laughs> Don't let the Admiralty hear you say that. Captain on the bridge. Sid. Sid, everyone. You all know, I'm not big on speeches. We're embarking on the first mission since our refit. Let's make it a good one. Disengage docking clamps. Docking clamps released. Thrusters ahead, Mr. Hendar. Easy. Thank you. I'm fine. Really, I... Uh... You don't look so good. I have to get to sickbay. Go. Well, that was quite a scare. A few minutes more and it would have been one of the shortest tenues on record for a first officer. Is that the engineer that was out on the hull? That storm did a real number on her, but she'll live. Just needs rest. You should worry about yourself. Your deridium levels got dangerously low and destabilized your cell structure. This is definitely one of the more memorable first days I can think of. My name is Dr. Aram Duval, Chief Medical Officer. To be honest, I've never met a Kobliad before. You're rare, I know. I was going to say special. Your people's numbers have dwindled, despite the Federation's efforts to find a more readily available alternative to the Duridium you need to survive. Yet you joined Starfleet and managed to thrive. I imagine the responsibility must be overwhelming. Maybe even a burden at times. It does make me unique, but it's not a burden at all. I'm honored to be Kobliad, to represent my people. As you should be. And don't worry, I won't treat you like a science experiment. I just do the science and leave the experiments to Solano. You don't agree with his methods? I don't agree with his definition of acceptable risks. Not when the lives of your crew are at stake. My professional opinion is that the accident took a toll. More than he's willing to admit. 
He's overstressed, operating in the pressure cooker of his own mind, which is never a good headspace when the lives of your crew are at stake. What concerns me is that now he's even further away from the thing he's been chasing his entire career. The breakthrough discovery, the major innovation, and something he can put his name on. The more the time passes and the further out of reach it gets, the more risk he'll be willing to take. People become blinded by their own ambition. I've seen it happen before. I hear you. But that's my job, isn't it? To make sure that doesn't happen. And we don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Which is exactly why I'm so glad you're here. We need you now more than ever. And I have to give you credit for what happened on the bridge. It took guts to defy a direct order. Huh. I guess word travels fast around here. It's a small ship. And everyone's curious about the new XO. Fortunately, your cell structure is almost completely stabilized. And I'll spare us both the lecture, but I do feel it's my responsibility to remind you, without regular infusions of deridium, you will not live. It's as simple as that. Understood. Then, my work here is done. Lieutenant Bedrosian. I came to see if you were okay. We were all pretty worried on the bridge. No one knew what was happening. I'm feeling much better. Thank you. It's just part of who I am. You don't have to explain to me. I understand. I'm just glad you're okay. You trusted me earlier with the shields, and I appreciated that. I want you to know that I have your back. Thank you. Complete the diagnostic sequence, and this shuttle will be cleared for service. Yes, sir. The storm in the Hotari region will interfere with our transporters, so we need all available shuttlecraft in working order. Excuse me, Commander Turbok. Petty Officer Maris. I will leave you to your work. Stopped by sick bay and saw Nui. I figured you'd want to know. It's my fault she's in there. I should have made her go first. Maybe, but I wouldn't want to see you hurt like that any more than her. Dr. Duval said she'll be back on duty soon, though. Come on. I have to run the final diagnostic. I can't stay long. I've got a long to-do list before we get to Hotari, and things are piling on faster than I can check them off. We're making all our last-minute checks in security, too. Tactical and security are short-staffed. Well, nothing's ever 100%, but we'll be good to go. And if you wait until you are ready, it's probably too late. Which is why I didn't want to wait for just the right time. I had a chance to think about this while I was away. Then you and Millie almost got killed out on the hall. And I thought it was important that I just come out and tell you. Instead of tiptoeing around it. Or worse. This is just a guess, but you like me. Is that what this is? How do you know? Must have been pretty obvious. Which is funny, because... It kinda came out of nowhere for me, at first. Well, you know... I was hoping. I guess that makes this a little easier to say. We've been really good friends for a long time. I wanna see if there's more between us... ...than just being friends. You don't have to explain it. I feel the same way. There is something between us. 
So, do you want to find out what that something is? If it's there for you, and it's there for me, why not give it a try? We don't have to put too much pressure on it. Let's just see where this goes. I like that. Definitely felt some pressure coming down to see you. These are uncharted territories. I'd call it a chemistry experiment. You know, with us. I'm just really glad that you said something. I've seen how you operate. I couldn't wait for you to make the first move. I'm glad, too. So whatever happens next is great with me. Level one diagnostic complete. I have to get back to that to-do list. They're probably looking for me. Can't blame them. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. the rendezvous point outside Atari space. Helm, bring us out of war. Dropping to impulse. Ionic interference surging, Captain. Shield integrity holding. We can take it. We are at the correct coordinates to meet the shuttle. Commander Rydeck, find us our diplomat, if you will. Aye, Captain. Let's reduce the noise. Filter out environmental signals. I can manually tune what's left for Federation signal types. I've located the shuttle. Opening comms. On screen. Shuttle to Resolute. Shuttle to Resolute. Debris field. Lost maneuvering. Losing. I can't get it any clearer. Get a transporter lock. It's just not happening. Power up the tractor beam. We'll pull them directly into the docking bay. Diaz, you good to run the tractor emitter? Yes, sir. Come on, Diaz. First thing. Lock onto the shuttle and stabilize the rotation. We're pulling in debris. I'm on it. gonna take out the shuttle. Here's the bridge. There's a large piece of debris headed for the shuttle. The tractor beam can't handle it. Can our shields take it? I believe so. Commander Rydeck, plot an intercept course. On it. Here we go. Maneuvering thrusters bearing 53 Mark 17, 200 meters on an intercept course. Maneuvering. Got it. Whoa! 
Someone's working hard on the bridge. Shuttlecraft on board. Good job. We're on our way down to meet them. Terra firma, so to speak. Ambassador Spock? Captain, we'll be right down to meet you, sir. In that case, I will wait for him here. Apologies for the landing, Ambassador. I was operating the tractor beam, sir. I take responsibility. It was not the smoothest transit, but you got us here safely. That is what matters. We thought we were prepared for our arrival in Hotari space, but it is evident my craft was not sufficiently robust for such intense ionic activity. The storm has been pretty intense. There was an element that was most unusual. Before you came to our aid, our maneuvering thrusters and impulse engines were rendered inoperable. So we attempted a short traversal at warp speed, only to find that we could not achieve warp at all, even though our diagnostics computer showed no faults or anomalies. What do you make of that? Well, all indications say that warp speed is possible, but in practice, we find it is not. Well, this storm is one of the strangest phenomena we've ever encountered. It's disrupted other systems, and who knows what it might do to a warp drive. Yes, it would seem further investigation is called for. We'll take readings, run some additional diagnostic checks, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Quite logical, Petty Officer... Carter Diaz, sir. Thank you. Ambassador Spock. Excuse me. I'm honored to have you aboard. I'd like to get right to it. We're already behind. Ambassador Spock, my senior staff. It's not every day that a captain gets to welcome a Starfleet legend aboard. Hmm. You flatter me, Captain Solano. But legend implies the past tense, whereas I am very much focused on our present circumstances. I didn't mean to suggest you were stuck in the past. You're right, Ambassador. Not the most diplomatic choice of words. Your experience comes from the past. But our present situation calls for it. True enough. We were hoping you could fill us in on the details. We got the basics from Starfleet. Two formerly peaceful neighbors are now on the brink of war. Indeed. And the tension between them grows fiercer by the hour. Olivia and Hotari. The Olivians are the more advanced species. They made first contact with the Hotari over a century ago. This is Tau, the Hotari moon. 
It is rich in dilithium, and for decades, the Hotari and the Illidians have shared a mining operation there. The Illidians provide the technological resources, while the Hotari have served as the labor force. The stability of that arrangement was the source of their peace, until recently. The Hotari have suddenly and forcefully seized control of the mining operations and expelled the Illidians from their system. That is the official story, as told by the Hotari when they requested Federation mediation. But the details remain scant. Communications between all parties have been limited by the ionic interference. What are the Hotari defensive capabilities? Do they stand a chance to hold on to the mines now that they've taken them? It is unlikely the relatively primitive Hotari forces would prevail against the Illidian fleet in open war. But it would have been equally unlikely to predict they could take possession of the mines until they did just that, which leaves many unanswered questions. Left unchecked, this conflict will result in more bloodshed, which is what we are here to prevent. And the dilithium trade hangs in the balance. Clearly the Hotari have been exploited in this relationship. Maybe we can persuade them peace is the more profitable alternative for everyone. They both profited from the mines. And for the Hotari, something is better than nothing. Peace is our objective after all. That is correct. If we could convince them, it would restore the peace. But we would need the Hotari to accept a difficult compromise. Made all the more difficult by the emotions flaring on both sides, no doubt. Neither the Illidians or the Hotari are members of the Federation. So we can't make them do anything. There is an additional complicating factor I should mention. In the past, the Federation has relied on the Illidians as a source of dilithium. That certainly changes things. The Federation sources its dilithium from a lot of places. Yeah, and this is one of them. That means the Hotari have no reason to trust us. I wouldn't go that far, Commander. We are completely neutral in this matter, on neither one side nor the other. Any suggestion otherwise would compromise our position. Given the Federation's involvement in the Illidium dilithium trade, Captain Solano and I must make every effort to appear neutral in these negotiations. What worries me is if this whole thing unravels and we're at the mercy of the storm at less than full strength. We can't let it come to that. Considering what the Ion Storm has done to our ship and the Ambassador's shuttle, we have to assume the Illidian fleet has had problems with it as well. This recent surge in the energy disturbance temporarily levels the playing field. Commander Westbrook is correct. The energy anomalies around the Hotari systems have been noted in the past. But they have never been observed on the orders of magnitude we have seen in recent weeks. If it's keeping the two sides talking instead of shooting at each other, that actually helps us negotiate a peace. And we'll take advantage of that as long as it works in our favor. And when it doesn't? All the more reason to learn as much about it as we can while we are here. We do not want to be caught unprepared should the energy anomaly continue to fluctuate. So I trust we understand our circumstances. We're operating on a strict timetable here, and we're going to be leaving for the negotiations shortly. Commander Westbrook, I want you to leverage our systems to investigate the anomaly from here while we're gone. Hi, Captain. Thank you all. Dismissed. I want to speak to both of you privately. Ambassador Spock, I'd like to make a formal introduction. My first officer, Commander Jara Rydek. Commander, as you are aware, there are limits to what Captain Solano and I can do in our official capacity as representatives of the Federation. But someone in an unofficial capacity, your first officer, for example, would not be bound by those restrictions. Commander Ryder could ingratiate herself to certain parties behind the scenes, where they may be more candid in revealing information that could lead to a resolution. 
She certainly goes her own way. Maybe that helps in this case. It would be unconventional, but I'm not opposed to it. I'm honored to be included in the negotiation process. You're not just included. You are instrumental. Well, I hope Commander Rydek will have more luck finding out what really happened than we will through official diplomatic channels. The fate of the negotiations, the interests of the Federation, and the prospect for peace may very well depend on it. Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments. But I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. Especially when I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. The Ambassador asked me to take a look, and I'm ready to crack this thing open. Good. You could learn from Mr. Diaz's focus. I'll take notes. Then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. One nice thing about Vulcans, Chobok is the only person who didn't look at this and treat me like I was something to pity. Doc says I should get used to it. Doesn't mean I want to be reminded of it every minute of the day. Hey, you won't get pity from me. I think it makes you look tough. As tough as you really are, that is. And that makes you sound pretty smart. I might need you to save me for myself next time, though. <laughs> Come on. Let's get to the bottom of this. Ready to go? All set. Let's run the diagnostic. your talk with Miranda. You, you do? She sent me a priority one dispatch right after your conversation. I'm happy for you. Both of you. <sighs> Thanks. But I'm only going to tell you this once. Don't screw this up. Because I would be very unhappy if you tried this out and then, I don't know, six weeks or six days later I have to start splitting holidays between the two of you. All because things went south, and you're not on speaking terms. That just isn't gonna work for me. And I know you'll respect that. That's not gonna happen, okay? And why are you even going there? We haven't even gone on a date yet. I just want you to know where I stand. I like my friends, and I like our group. I don't want to lose that. Is that thing done yet? Yeah. It's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown. The backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. Here. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? The warp field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look.
There was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. Subspace variance out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Yes, ma'am. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings, and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. And they're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance, or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked, or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. Let's not overcomplicate this. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the nacelles for a cracked coil. I checked every coil on the port nacelle for imbalances. If any coil in either engine were cracked, I would have detected it. So, it must be the navigation array. Except it's not. Checked and double-checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. escorting the negotiating team to the surface as soon as they come down from the bridge. I don't want to interrupt some important work. I was just hoping to see you before I go. The captain and the others will be here any minute now. Should be an interesting ride down to the surface. You're the one with the important job to do. Keeping the captain safe. And Ambassador Spock. 
It doesn't always feel that way. Baking in the hot sun, standing guard next to an empty shuttlecraft. But it has its moments. Hey, Maris. Aren't these those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari. That another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> Gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole, uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. Catch you all later. You don't want to miss your train. I do have to go. Not gonna lie, I'd rather not leave right now. More important things on my mind. Go on, do your job. I'll be right here waiting for you when you get back. You better be. Be seeing you. Edsalar de Diaz. If you could float back down to reality, we still have a ways to go. All right, where were we? So, the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You wanna take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands-on maintenance. I like it. Okay, the nav computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double-check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, we'll know it. Let's run through the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Same. Warp field inversion and the cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if the subspace variance was a momentary occurrence? That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure return non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? Put the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should warp just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Static field intensity, warp 1.1. 1.2. Warp pressure is destabilizing. Error in warp field calculation. The warp drive has experienced a system-wide cascade failure. Warp field collapsed. Subspace variance is out of tolerance. Cochrane formula results are undefined. Bingo. what -o? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship. Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us. The Resolute will not sustain warp. We can't leave Hotari space.
Ambassador Spock, Captain Solano, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you've come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours, and this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind and unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. We are honored to be here as representatives of the Federation. I'm so glad. These must be the representatives of the mighty Federation, the reigning authority in the galaxy, or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin, and this is Citron, the heroes of the revolt in the mines. Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. I think we're about to begin. Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? I don't know what we're walking into here. But that guy was something. Something about his tone tells me this won't be easy. That was my sense as well. I doubt he speaks for all of Atari. So I would urge patience until we speak with their queen. Ambassador Spock, welcome to Hotari Prime. The honor is mine, Your Majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Hotari people and their queen, but recognition of our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elydian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. But his point is well taken. What is the Federation's interest in this matter? Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. Saying this wouldn't be easy was an understatement. I thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Cobliard? She's not part She can of... speak for herself, can't she? Then let her. Now then, what is your name? Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. 
Being a Colviard, you would know better than anyone. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. Their injustice towards the Colviard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Alidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! If after all the Colbiard suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. Perhaps, Commander Rydak. Perhaps. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No, it was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our mind. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? I want the truth, not your Federation rhetoric. It's possible the Federation has an interest in both peace and securing a steady source of dilithium. One does not preclude or prevent the other. But that's just my personal opinion. Given the Federation has done business with the Elidians for decades, I would agree. It's entirely possible, if not highly likely. What they haven't said, but cannot deny, is a simple truth. The dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without Elidian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone, especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before Dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. So tell me, who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on Tau? Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidians? It can only be one or the other, not both. If I have to choose only one, then it would have to be the Hotari. Well said! How could the just and wise Federation make any other choice? <gasps> this is an outrage! The Federation has lost all credibility! The mines are ours! Lydia will not be deterred! Take back our minds by any means necessary. And you will see more blood spilled. I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives.
I suppose there is some sense to that. I hope we meet again, Jara Rai. Spock and I will cover everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? You've chosen to side with the Hotari. I knew the Federation would see through the Elidians' baseless claims and protect the interests of my people. Even though the Hotari should have control of the mines, some of the Elidian claims are still valid. There you're wrong, but we can agree to disagree. I assume you were there, the day the mines were seized from the Elidians. Not seized. Reclaimed. And restored to their rightful owners. Yes, I was there. We had to be decisive. Before the Elidians could even realize their worst nightmares upon them. I'm curious why the Elidians haven't fought back. They have the ability to retake the mines any time they want. Ability is one thing. Courage is another. The Elidians know any hostile action on their part will not end well. They respect one thing above all else, and that is force. The greater the force, the more certain the outcome. Any talk of making peace is just that and worth little without the strength to secure it. Which makes me wonder about your ship, the Resolute. Undoubtedly the Federation's finest warship. Ready to contend with anything the Elidians might have in store. Or is that not true? Maybe I've misjudged it. I wouldn't say state of the art. But the Resolute is plenty capable and can hold its own against just about anything. Let's hope so. Because at the moment, it's the only thing preventing them from wiping us off the map. Sidron. A pleasure meeting you, Commander. I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Soothing. Commander Rydeck, I'm encouraged to see the Federation supporting my people. I'm afraid of what might happen without your help. I'm glad to hear it. I just hope you're not the only one who feels that way. I apologize for that. These are unusual times, to say the least. Much is changing. I saw you speaking with Sidron, our national hero. I'm curious, what did he say? He seems to be of the opinion that negotiating for peace is a waste of time. Because force is the only blunt instrument he understands. He's a miner, not a diplomat. For the first time in our history, the Hotari have the upper hand. We see ourselves as strong instead of downtrodden. New voices have risen up. Old voices shouted down. Galvin and Sidron have become national heroes. 
Now they have the queen's ear. For better or worse, depending on your perspective. I take it they're against a negotiated peace with the Elidians. Heroes tend to want more of what made them heroic. If it were up to them, they'd wage all-out war and bring ruin upon us all. My fear has been that the Elidians will launch an attack and crush us. You've seen their starship, no doubt. They could have retaken the mines whenever they wanted to, but it never happened. And as strange as this may sound, I'd almost say they're afraid. I just don't know what they're afraid of. It's still the same bluster and bravado you would expect from them. But it has no teeth. Like they're afraid of what might happen. Do you think it has something to do with the Ion Storm? Right now, it's stronger than ever, isn't it? It's entirely possible. I'm not a scientist, but I do know the storm has knocked out all kinds of systems. So maybe the Elidians weren't willing to risk their ships, given all the interference. Since the day of the revolt, Galvin has seized control of the mines and restricted all access. No one's allowed without his personal authorization. And they've taken over a section of the palace with just as much secrecy and security. I'm told it could be something they brought back from the mines. They've made inquiries, but everyone pretends it doesn't exist. I strongly suspect they're hiding something. What do you think it is? I've heard rumors it's some sort of ancient artifact, but I haven't seen it myself. How can we know? I'd better see what's happening. Do you think you can find out what they're hiding? I need to see proof of something before I can make my case to the Federation. I can try, but even if I found it, I might not know what to make of it. Take this. You can use it to capture whatever you find, and then send it to me. Thank you. I will let you know what I find. And I look forward to our meeting again. Sorry, I couldn't help but notice you were speaking with the Hotari this whole time. I figured in the interest of fairness, I should offer another perspective. Of course. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but these negotiations rely on the Federation's neutrality, as does any hope you might have for a supply of dilithium in the future. So why you would choose to side with the Hotari escapes me. Without a Lydian involvement, there is no dilithium trade. But clearly, you weren't aware. We are and will remain completely neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution to this conflict. As is ours. Of course, the question is, at what price? A major solid, Arminta. Special Attaché, Elidian Armed Forces. Pleasure to meet you, Commander. <laughs>